We have our last speaker, Yiping Lu. And Yiping is a second year PhD student of the Institute of Computational and Mathematical Engineering in Stanford. Before joining Stanford, he received a bachelor's degree in uh, the School of Mathematical Science in Peking University um, and major in information computing science. Yiping has a wide range of research interest in many fields of machine learning. So today he will talk about optimization. Um, he will talk about understanding and improving optimization of deep ResNets and continuous steps of the view from theory to practice. Okay, let's welcome Yiping. Uh, yeah, thanks for the invitation and introduction. So today I want to introduce this topic like how can we use a continuous steps ODE to help to understand and improve the optimization of a deep breath net. So the, uh, my motivation is starting from the deep, deep learning evolution. What we can see is that if we add more layers, our neural network are still getting better. So it's a natural question to ask is that can we just limit the layers numbers to in, in finite? So then we can, a lot of previous work have shown that if you have a rest net and you limit the layers to infinite and you can get an ODE model, uh, so it's like the rest net can be understand as a overall discretization uh, of a time evolving ODE. Here it's like the layer will turn to the time in our ODE. But there are also questionable voices that saying that ODEs and neural networks look like just apples and oranges, one one can help another. There are many previous works shows that you can use it to encoding some physics to neural network. As an example, if you want your neural network to be stable, then you can use a stable scheme. You want your neural network to conserve some energy, then you can use some energy conserving scheme. Also, you can approximate uh, optimal transport map. You can be robust to adversary examples. You can adapt in your neural network to task structures. You can also use your neural network for physics learning. So it's like now, if we want to understand a machine learning problem, you should go to these three, three uh, perspective. The first one is the modeling. It's like I have a machine learning model. The modeling is like I want to approximate this function. How can I write down a parametric formula to approximate it? Then you need to optimize it. It's like a loss function between your model and the true function. And then you will inference it on a new model, on some new data. So for my talk, I will just emphasize on the optimization part. You can find more at my homepage. So I will just split the talk into two parts. One is the theory part, another is the algorithm design part. The difference of my approach at like the optimization community was the difference between my approach and theirs is like, if you take a well, well optimization class, what you will have is like minimize the FX. But the FX, you just know that you can assess its gradient, you can assess its tension, you can assess its value, it is all. But now I want to understand the, the optimization of a deep neural network. So what I should do is like, I should write down the neural network into my objective functions. So you can see here, what I'm studying is this objective. It's like minimize the loss function subject to a uh, neural network, the T here is like the layer, so you have a compositional structure in the constraint. And here L is the, uh, like the loss function, and R here can be a regularization function like the weight decay function. Then I limit the T here, goes to the infinity, and you just re re replace the constraint to an ODE. Then it goes to optimal control problem. It looks like the optimal control problem can be considered as a limiting landscape of the optimization of deep neural network. For, if you want to solve an optimal control problem, the textbook will tell you that you need to write down the adjoint equations. The adjoint equation is like a backward in time ODE. What it characterizes like the PT here is the gradient respected to XT. So it's like the backward propagation, the adjoint equation is calculating the gradient of my loss function respected to my feature map. So it's like I write down a new backward equation. So it's like I, I, I have write down a new uh, back propagation algorithm. Is this a new method? Actually not. What you can prove that adjoint equation is just back propagation because the back propagation is also calculating the gradient of the, your loss function respected to your feature map. 
So if they are the same, why the optimal control formulation can help? It's like for the previous papers, it's like the neural ordinary differential equation, it, it, it looks like the ODE because it's ODE, the solution has some uniqueness. So the ODE is an invertible model. So, uh, but our work will give another answer. It's like, if you go through these formulations, you can find out the structure of optimizing a deep neural network. So it's like, I think this slide is just, borrow from an uh, optimization guide. So it's like he wants to say that optimization is very successful. It's very important. It's like, why? It's like, if you consider the neural network as the train, then the stochastic gradient descent method is the single un powered unit of the train. But actually, if you want to have a better train, you know what you need is like every unit has, should have its own power. So it's like we should combine the optimization neural network and other things together and then analyze it together. Also, our framework using the adjoint equation is not the only framework. We can also use the Hamiltonian Jacobi equations framework, the dynamic programming framework to learn neural network. And here are some empirical papers using this to optimize a neural network. Also, you can extend it here to SDE while you're using some dropout in the ResNet. It's like, if you want to solve a SDE control problem, what you first think about is to solve a backward, backward stochastic differential equation. Actually, you can just extend the adjoint equation framework to the SDE using something called ETOMAP. Yeah, so it's like, let's, let's go to what I have done in, on this area. So it's like, I have write down this very clean formula, but it still it helps. It's like, if you want to know what's the optimization, it's like what we want to answer, it's like, can it goes to a global optima, right? But if you write down this very clean formulation, even go to the infinite depth limit, what you know is like, this is still a non complex problem. So what I have tried to do is that I want to find a continuous model who have a very good landscape. So let's just go back to, consider there are global convergence proofs of the neural network, there are two regimes. The one regime is the neural tangent kernel regime where it linearizes the model at the initialization of the weight. So that the feature map is just the gradient of the weight, uh, uh, the gradient of the neural network respect to the weight at the initialization. So it's just a kernel model, then you can just uh, learn a linear structure on it. The good thing is that you can pro provide a proof of convergence of any structure of the neural network, but there are also some drawbacks. It's like the feature is not data dependent, it is lazy learned. So we, we want to go beyond this regime. So what we consider is the mean field regime. What the mean field regime means that it's like, I just consider the lost landscape respected to the distribution of weights. If you consider the law the, the loss the respect here to the distribution of weights, you can see that now it is just a linear regression because it is linear respected, or the output is linear respected to a distribution of weights. So the objective function here is a convex function. But but just a remind here uh, in the mean field regime, what I'm saying just uh, it's a two-layer neural network, so that you can just uh, replace the sum here into integral or expectation, then the objective is a linear one. So you can see that the, the this approach is very hard to generalize beyond two layers. So what can if I ask I... you something? Hello? Hello? Yeah, can I, can I make a comment? Yeah, yeah. So I, I didn't want to say this, but since you know, several people repeated this, I want to say that, to, claim, to, to say that by translating to um, uh, this, this immediate picture here gives you yeah. oh, a convex new, uh, language, uh, landscape. That's misleading. That's okay, really so, so, so you mean that the convex really is the log two space? For, for, you, know, you know we the right co concept here is not convexity, but displacement convexity. Okay. So, yeah. and, you know, you, even, even at the, even, you don't have to take the mean field limit. Even finite, fi you know, uh, uh, neural, net neural network with finite number of neurons, if you think of it as, as a, um, uh, if, you, if you change the variable to be the distribution, it's formally convex, but that doesn't help at all. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think I, I can just restate my statement as this. It's like, if you consider the uh, objective function in, uh, respected to the L2 space, then it's a convex function. Well, yeah, but how does this convexity help? Yes, the, 
the convexity will not help you because you are using a gradient descent to okay, train so why it. Do, our why do you make this point? I mean, yeah, yeah. This, this sort of convex doesn't help. Why do you make this, you know, a highlight of the, of the point of the, of the slide here? Okay, I, I, I think it's because it's like, so, so, so this tells us that if you want to go to say something about Washashta, you can just first consider something in O2 space. So it's like, it's just a motivation of my following work because we first give out the landscape results in the L2 space and then go to the Washashtan space. It's like, it's very hard to just directly go to the Washashtan space because you, you, you should go to the displacement convexity, you should go to the geodesic, it's some kind complicated. So we can just consider the very simple things in our L2 space, right? Okay, anyway, I mean, anyway, yeah. I, I, I think it's a nice, Way to think about things, but even yeah. people repeatedly say that this is convex and stuff like that. It really is a bit of misleading because this convexity is not the relevant convexity. Yes, yes. I, I think I, I next time I should have a note here. It's like the convexity is in L two, but not Washashtan. So here it still have a gap. Yeah, okay. yeah. Please go, please go on. Yes. Yes. So it's like we want to go beyond the two layer case, goes to the ResNet case. So it's like following the uh, uh, proof of uh, work, we consider the residual net respected to the distribution of the residual blocks. So here have some very subtle difference. Here, I just write down the distribution and respect it to theta and the t, you can see it's rho theta t. It's like I consider the distribution of the residual block. We, I also consider where the residual block is sampled in time. But also you can have another formulation. It's just like rho t theta. It's like for every layer, I have a distribution and I sample the residual block. I think the two are very similar, but they might have some different uh, properties, I don't know, but in the proof, you can, in my proof, is that if you just want to say something about the landscape, they are the same. Yes. So here, the, the single change here, just like I, I changes, doesn't consider the individual residual block. I consider the distribution of the residual block. Then what I want to consider is like the landscape respected to the row in L2 space. So if I write down my model, it just looks like this, and you can write down the adjoint equation as what you have done before. So the theorem here saying that is like, if I go to the L2 space, the, 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 the landscape is very good. If you go to the L2 space, what it can tell you is that, uh, what it can tell, sorry, sorry, the theorem is, should look like this. In the L2 space, what it can tell you is looks like, if my gradient is not zero, if my gradient is zero, then my loss is zero. It means that my every local minima is global minima. This sounds very counterintuitive, but I can tell you why. So our formulation is from uh, previous empirical work is saying that the deep residual network behaves like an example of shallow networks. How can we do this? It's just like, this is my first residual block. And then I write down my second residual block. You can see that I have do a Taylor expansion. So for the second residual block, your input is the, is the first residual block, but I just fill it into two parts. It's like the input is just the our input and another is like the difference uh, introduced by you just propagating it through the first layer. It's just like a Taylor expansion to linearize the theta here. So if you do such things, you can see the first two terms is just like a two layer neural network. So you can, you can do it to, uh, several times and you can get something like this. And the leading term here is looks like uh, just an example of different networks. And the next part here is just something, a uh, skills like uh, inverse of factorial. So can we write down this very formulae to say that, the, okay, the residual network behaves like the example of shallow network is like two layer networks. Can we write down, write it down? very formally. So our way to write down is like, so for the previous work here, it looks like it is the forward pro process. But if we want to analyze the landscape, what we interested in is the backward process. So we just write down the backward process of the two layer neural network and the residual network. You can see the only difference here is, is that the residual network will just have a further back propagation through the 
and through the adjoint equation. So if we can lower bound it, the norm of the solution to the adjoint equation, it seems that my adjoint equation will not animate the signal too much. It can still preserve some signal. Then I can say that the residual network, it, the landscape is, looks very similar to the two layer one. So that you can have this theorem, a theorem. So like Proof uh, comment uh, earlier, this theorem here is just in the L2 space. It's not in the Warshawstein space. So if you want to go to the Warshawstein space, what you should have a further claim is that the, the, if you want to say, if you use a stochastic gradient descent converges to a global minima, you should have a further assumption that it is for supported. You can also see there are two recent works have very similar uh, assumptions as ours. It's like the first paper is assuming that they are a three layer neural networks mean field, re uh, mean field regime. What they assume is that every, every layer is a universal approximator of the function. It looks, this proof is very, looks very similar as our proof. And for the second paper, what they assume that is that the activation function is uh, monotonic so that the gradient of it is just uh, multiply some positive number so that it will not animate the signal. This is two, two recent works in the mean field regimes to prove the global convergence result. Yeah, so um, can I ask a question? Yeah. Um, I'm not entirely sure I understood the point before correctly. So when you say that a residual network is essentially a, an average of shallow neural networks, would that mean that the space of residual networks is no more expressive than the space of two layer neural networks? No, I, I think I think it's just some okay. I think it's it's saying that the, the two layers neural networks function can all be expressed by a residual network, but the inverse is not true, it's because I have some higher order term. So maybe the higher order term here can give you some more functions, right? It's just like in, in a landscape analysis, I, the two layer is good. So if I want to do a, two, uh, a landscape analysis, I just want to go to go back to the two layer case. Right? But do the higher order terms go to zero as you take the number of layers to infinity or not? No, not. So it's like it's the inverse of a fact bacterial. It can be something. So it, so what I'm saying here is, is just like this something will not affect the landscape, but it may affect other things like the generalization, maybe the other other stuff. It may, may it maybe the difference of two model may may hidden here, but it's like in the landscape, the this term will not uh, affect things. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. So you can also have a numerical scheme. It just like follows what Ule told uh, previously. I just use a, a particle, uh, a particle approximation of my rho theta t. And here is the difference. It's like if you want to go to the mean field limit, one one tricky thing is that every particle should be the same, right? They should be symmetric. So here you can see the algorithms between our algorithm and just you just train a retina, the, the difference is here because every particle should be symmetric. So we have a sorting scheme. So it's like I, 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 we need to sort different tau here. So it's like well, I, we should, uh, for my particle, I have a theta and a t, and for the t, I should sort it, then I can know what is the order of the particles and then go through the, neuro, go through the retina. Empirically, it, 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 it shows some benefit on different data sets and especially for the shallow nets, this can help because it looks like I just find a adaptive schemes, uh, adaptive approximation of ODE. So for the uh, very shallow rest net, it, it looks the performance boost is very significant, but for the deeper one, it just have some marginal benefit. So also we can't prove the convergence of this thing. So we are still trying to prove the convergence of this thing. It just like it, it shows some very interesting behaviors. So for the first part, I want to have the take home message. It's like we proposed um, a continuous limit for deep rest net. The motivation is that we want a good landscape. It's not like I just want to have a limiting, uh, limiting, 
model for the ResNet. We, we want the limiting model to have to have some uh, good uh, good properties. I want to make another remark here. It's like if you want to go to the previous ODE limit, you should add very strong assumptions. You can see a previous paper you, you, to prove the gamma convergence of the to, to prove the gamma convergence of the ResNet model and the ODE model. What they add is like if you if you have deeper networks, the realization term zero will becomes very strong. So it's like it doesn't look like what we use in practice in, in what what you use in practice will not have a stronger uh, uh, regularization while we have deeper layers. So it's like we want to we want to uh, go beyond that regularization, but actually actually it doesn't prove the convergence of the discrete model of the continuous model. So it's still an open question. So we want to go beyond the regularization. It is also one of the motivation here. And for our new continuous limit, we, we observed our local minimizer is a global minimizer in L2 space. And we, we propose a potential scheme to approximate, but we don't have pr proofs. So for the for, for, for the further works, we can analyze the Washash and gradient flow. We can analyze the numerical scheme. It's like the, the two analysis in our paper are, are also very weak. And uh, also one thing we have, we have discussed earlier is like, what does the high order terms in the explanation from ResNet to the example of small networks means? So what does the high order terms means here? It, it should look like why the ResNet is better than the uh, two layer net, maybe some mystery is hidden there. Yeah, it, it, for the first part of the talk, if you have questions, you can ask now and I will just switch to the algorithm design scene. Okay. Uh, can can I ask a question? Yeah. Uh, can you? Yeah, yeah, I can. Move, hear you. Uh, okay. Uh, can you? Uh, I'm confused about the what's the standard gradient flow for the ResNet. Yeah. Uh, the problem is okay. Can you go go here because now you are talk you are say the gradient flow is uh, for the the joint distribution in both the layers and the premise of each layers, right? Yes. So uh, if you uh, think, it, think it about it's a joint distribution, then the particles is exchangeable for the different layers. Yes. That's no difference. But but for the, okay, so if we have a same problem, have a same probability, but the problem is that for the uh, forward propagation, forward update of the ODE, yeah. if you change the tall, the, okay, if you commutate the tall arbitrarily, then actually you have a, I think actually we can we will have the different ODEs. That means if you okay now we have a joint distribution and then you make a, a, a switch of the different tall, then you get a different ODEs that will give us a different flow map. Yes. So this is a little bit inconsistent for for me. How do you explain this? So here it's like you should have a you you should have some regularity of the you should have some regularity of your flow model respect to the uh, change of your of your row right uh what's the regularity here so the regularity means that if you just have a small perturbation of your row your output should not uh, it should also perturb just a small thing right um i have switched the two particles so it's like I have switched two particles. It's like if the row here in Washash band distance, it changes very little. I, I just switched two particles. The, the Washash band cost can be very, very small. And we have proved that if you 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 perturb your row here in Washash band space for a very small value, then the output will also change in a very small value. Yeah, I, I agree that uh, the, the forward uh, uh, ODE, which is uh, probably very robust against the uh, robust, uh, very stable about the small perturbation of the, the distribution. However, because the, the exchange of the time tall, which yeah. will introduce, it's not a small change of the right hand side of the ODE. Because if, you, for example, you change the, uh, the distribution from uh, tall equals to one to tall equals to one over two, it's a big change. The ODE, the right hand side of ODE have a big change. Yes. It's not a small change. Yes, here, here, our space is the Washington gradient flow. 
Yeah, this is for optimize the loss function. Yeah, yeah. So, so it's like in the construction space. If if you if you switch a particle from a, a very a, a, for a very later time to a very uh, to 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 a to a very earlier time, the the cost can also be very large, right? Um. But uh. I think I have to be a little bit confused because you can actually totally reverse the the, the time la the layer parameter at all. Then you actually have one completely reverse the ODE. How the flow map is still output the same functions? Yeah, 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 yeah. So, 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 so it's like to formulate the problem is like what's the cost of you switch one layer to another layer? So if you if you switch it, we are using our Shasta and distance. So if you switch it from a very later layer to a very previous layers. So, so it's like if I just change it from T to some T minus delta T, the output will not change so much, right? Yes, I agree with that. Yeah. But if I go to a very earlier time, then the function will be different. So it's yeah. like why the reason is like the, the underlying phase here should be our Shasta. So in the Washington space, you will not have the problem, right? Because if you switch a particle from very later time to very earlier time, then the out, the output will change a lot, and also your 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 your, 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 your Washington distance between the two distributions is also very large, right? Uh -huh. um, maybe we should postpone the more intricate details of the discussion to after the talk and let that continue for now. But I will. I would also uh, be curious then if you've got models where neurons can drift from one layer to the other. Did you do experiments and see how it compares to yeah, normal uh, algorithms where neurons are fixed for one layer? Yeah. So it's here. It, it's like for, for for shallow network, it, it looks better because it's like you you can switch the position of the different neurons in, in, in very shallow layers, it, it might help you. Because you can find a very adaptive approximation of your, of your OD. But for, for, for deeper nets, you can see that the points here are very, are, 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 are very similar. So it's like for deeper nets, it, it might not help so much. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Yeah, also some, some remark is like, uh, I think some following work extend a previous Chiza and Bach's paper to K homogeneous functions, and if, you, if, and if you use that result with ours, you can you can extend the result to the standard rest that we are using, like the the bottleneck structures. There, you can just use it as a three homogeneous function, and also if you regularize the RKHS norm of the weight, you can have the generalization bound. It's like following the Taiji Suzuki's uh, papers. Yeah. So let's let's now switch to the algorithm design. So for algorithm design, it's like we can utilize the structure of the neural network. So here, here I have a just an example to show why you can design algorithms that are adaptive to your neural network. The problem here I'm considering is the adversarial training. What's adversarial training? It's like first was adversarial example. It's saying that now the neural network is is very sensitive to some perturbations. If you add some noise. The noise is some specialized noise, then the output of the neural network can be totally wrong. So if you want to defend this kind of uh, attack, the nature thing you will do is the robust optimization. So what's the robust optimization? It's a minimax problem. The minimum problem is just like the training the neural network. And the max problem is finding the attacker. So this thing that I want to minimize my loss respected to the adversary. Okay, why this problem is very hard? So it's like this problem is extremely hard in practice. It's like, you can go to the adversarial example papers. If the papers are not from Google and Facebook, all the experiments must have done on Cypher. It's like even on Cypher 10, it's a very simple data set. The adversarial training still takes one day. So we want to accelerate it. So let's see why this problem is very hard. The, the problem is here. It's like my data is sampled online maybe. It's because every time I have a different data augmentation, you can't say the uh, attacker eta here. 
So for every time, you should solve the next problem exactly. So to solve the problem exactly, you will go to uh, you will use a gradient ascent on the eta. Sorry, here I made some I, I made some typo. Here should be eta. So you should use gradient ascent to have the eta. It's like if I want the gradient ascent on eta here to converge, you should have r time. Then you get the uh, uh, value of the inner inner function. Then you can do gradient descent on the output function, uh, uh, outer it, it, uh, outer functions minimization. So let's see this algorithm. So if you do the if you do the gradient ascent for r times, and then you go to the gradient descent, what's the problem here? The problem is that if you have a single descent on the uh, uh, parameter theta, here you have r plus one times of forward and back backward propagations. In MNIST, the r here can be 40, and for Cypher, the r here is 10. So it's like if you want to use the PGD method to, for the same iterations, same epoch, you will have 10 times to 40 times of time consuming on just to generate the adversary examples. The computation here is very imbalanced. So can we balance the computations here? First, let me just introduce the algorithm. Then let's go to some theory part to see why we why the algorithm is inspired by the optimal control. Because the algorithm here looks very simple. So it's like the, the idea here is like the previous algorithms the adversary adapt, uh, updater just consider the function as a black box function. But our method calls you, you only propagate once because I have said you, the problem here is like you are backward and forward propagation many times. So it's very hard. So we call it you only propagate once and you can get that adversary. So the adversary adapter knows the structure of the neural network. And, and the, from the uh, Analysis, you will look at the very tricky part, just the first layer. So the adversarial updater can just focus its attack on the first layer, but not the, the later layers. The algorithm is looked like this. I just split my neural network into two parts. One is the first layer, and the others are the other layers. So I also do the, use the back propagation because you know the back propagation is just an abstract equation. So it's like if I calculate the Actual equation, what you can get is like the uh, outputs gradient respect to the features, right? So it's like the output gradient respect to the first layer of features, the gradient here you can be calculated is the P here. So I just say the P. Then what I do is like my adversary will focus on the first layer. From the P here, you can get the gradient of the uh, gradient of P respect to your uh, input eta. So you can get the gradient of P respect to your eta and you use that gradient to attack many times. So now the calculation is just focused on the first layer. So it's a splitting scheme. It looks like I split it, the gradient calculation in the first layer and other layers. And uh, then you can ac accumulate all the gradients together and uh, to output and you can use SGD, ADM and also momentum gradient descent. That's the algorithm. So for the algorithm part, you can see that if you have M and N as two, two uh, outer iterations, like the time to calculate the adjoint equation, and N here is the every calculation of the adjoint equation, the time to attack. Now you just have M forward and backward propagation, and you have M times N's attack of the data. So now the algorithm is very efficient. So it's like if you if previous your algorithm is PGD 10, I can just give M as two and N as five. Then you have you reduce the time of forward and backward propagation from two to from two uh, from ten to two, right? So this can be very efficient. So if you want to analyze adversarial training using some optimal control viewpoint, what you can do is just like the same thing we have done before. You should write down the objective with the uh, with the neural network together, and then you will just replace the neural network as an ODE. So here you can see that adversarial training problems will become the differential game. The game is two controls. One is like I will optimize my neural network, and another is like I will attack your neural network. So if you if you want to use an optimal control viewpoint to to design the algorithm, the natural thing you will do is just like write, write down the Pontryagin maximal principle. So what's the Pontryagin maximal principle? You, you have faced it three times uh, in, in in today. So I think I can I can just uh, 
introduce a very, very, very fast. It's like I will define a Hamiltonian function, then you will have a forward equation, a backward equation, and a argmax of your Hamiltonian function. So if you write it down, you can see the forward equation is just the forward propagation of the neural network. And the backward equation is just the same as the adjoint equation. It is calculating the feature map. It's like the gradient of your output respect to your feature map. And you have another uh, argmax of your Hamiltonian functions. So these three parts together gives you the uh, uh, Poincaré maximal principle. I, I just want to have a remark here. It's like the Poincaré maximal principle is the KKT condition but actually it's somehow stronger than the KKT condition. If you just write down the KKT condition, what you can have here is like the H. The H here, it will, you, what you will get is just the gradient of H is equal to zero, you can't have the argmax. Why here is the argmax? It's because we will have another very, very simple assumption is like the every reachable set is a convex set. It's like not, not saying that my, my H here should be convex with back to every component. I'm saying that the, the set of all my F is like the set of the F can write down as a convex set, locally convex set. Then you can have argmax here because you, you, you can get every perturbation in your, in your control, then you can get argmax here. So it's like, if you have these very, very weak assumptions, then you can go a little bit further from the gradient of H equals to zero to the other max things. Yeah. So it's just a remark here. The, 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 the PMP is a little bit slightly stronger than the KKT condition. So it's like I write down the KKT condition of my optimization of E because it's a constraint optimization. It's very nature things to do. And then the next thing is that let's, let's look at the uh, uh, optimal, uh, look at the PMP here. The first two is just like the forward and backward propagation. So we want to reduce the, my computation on these two things. So if you want to reduce your computation on the first two things, what you need to do is like, I should focus my calculation at the last equation, like the maximum of the Hamiltonian function, right? So you can see here, the Hamiltonian function is defined layer by layer. So because of Hamiltonian function is defined layer by layer. So if you want to find out the argmax of Hamiltonian of the input adversarial, the adversarial is just attack at the first layer, right? So if you want to optimize the uh, Hamiltonian function respect to the adversarial, you just need to focus on the first layer. So that's why our algorithm designs like that, like a split of the first layer and other parts. So the, the Hamiltonian function here is layer by layer. So it's like in Wule's talk, he have proposed a maximal principle based uh, training. So in, in that part, your LBFGS can be separated to different, uh, different like computing GPUs Then it can be a parallel uh, process. But here we just want to have some structure to respect it to the adversary example. The structure here is very special because adversary example is the only thing just uh, coupled with your first layer. So it's like, that's the reason why we can just focus our calculation in the first layer. Although it, it goes back to the here, it's just a very simple splitting scheme. Yeah, so this is also called the coupled training. What's the coupled training? The idea here is, is that, the back propagation is a sequence process. Can we parallelize it, right? If you use back propagation to train a neural network, you must have the last layer's results, then you can have the other result, other layer. So it's a sequential process. How can we parallelize it? The idea here is like write down the constraint optimization as what well I have before, then use the ADMM method or some called a lifted mach mechanics. Yes, it's very similar to ADMM. It's just like they have very subtle difference in how to relax it. But here it's like ODE can give you some, some insight of how, how can you decouple it. So you can see the things is that the Hamiltonian updates here is, sequential, it is parallel. The sequential thing is just like the X and the P here, right? So there are also some works to show that you can use some, uh, uh, ODE, you can use some domain decomposition algorithms to do the parallel training. Yeah, so let, let's show the result of our algorithm. So it's like to achieve, because our algorithm is like a, a just balancing the computation cost. It's like it's, 
it's a trade-off. It doesn't mean that you can get the same result as the PGD if you have the same times of attack. So you can see to match the result of PGD 10, what we propose is like you post three five and you pull five three so three times five is 15 is just a little bit larger than 10 but the back propagation times is like a much a much less than the back propagation times in pgd so you can see the time here the time here their times is also time times of the nature training but ours is just like very similar to the time of nature training so you can now scale it to some larger a larger data set. So you can see here, it, but we don't do it. We just do the MNIST and Cypher. You can see on Cypher, we are four times faster and on MNIST, we are five times faster. Yes, and another algorithm is called adversarial training for free. You can see that adversarial tra training for free method, they are at the same time as ours next last year. The adversarial training for free method M is just UPO M1. So there are some special case of ours. Yeah, so let's have some take home message of the second part for the algorithm design things is like the, uh, if you go to opt optimal control framework, you can bridge the adversarial training with the differential game. And uh, using this viewpoint, we design an algorithm called the UPO. So the UPO's idea is like splitting the neural network to the first layer and other layers, because in the, in the Hamiltonian, uh, in, in, in the PMP, you can see that the adversarial example is just coupled with the first layers. So you can split the network into two parts, then you can focus your calculation in the first layer, then it's very cheap to have the adversarial examples. So at last, let me do some conclusion of the two parts. It's like I want to to answer the question, why the ODE formulations helps ours to understand to 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 help us our understanding of the deep learning. So the previous work are all about modeling because the numerical schemes design can tells you can, can preserve some uh, properties you want to preserve. So yes. So for my talk now, I want to go to the optimization part. For the optimization part, what I what I have showed that is that the ODE formulation can naturally capture the compositional structure of the neural network. So if you write down something in ODE, it will similarly will happen in neural network. So you can just analyze this as a simpler uh, problem, and then you can know what happens in the deep neural networks, and you can use that structure to design algorithms. But also you can also use the invertible of the ODE to design invertible networks because it's very important for some for, for some applications. But now in the optimization, there are also some further works. It's like that you can find the ODE that they are very easy to solve and they are easier to train, but there are no theoretical understanding. Just like some empirical work shows that you can regularize the gradients, regularize the high order gradients to let the ODE to become smooth so they are easy to solve. You will have some smaller numerical errors introduced by the schemes and somehow you can scale up the training. But why it is better, there is still some gap to understand. But what else can be explored? What else can be explored is like the all my talk here is about the modeling part and the optimization part. But there are still some less work done in the uh, in the uh, inference inferencing part. It's like if I what what we all do is like what we all do in the test time is like I will change my data, right? Will it be robust? So will it be first? Will it be data efficiency to learn the to learn the objective and to, will it becomes if you because you have another time structure here will it be robust to some distribution shift it can also be some open questions to have yeah so this is my talk it's just based on our papers published at UPO is published at NURBS last year and uh, Minfu ResNet is published at ICML this year and I also have a YouTube video here uh, here to summarize these two papers and you can also have some questions you can also contact my email yes yeah, so so now, if you have some question, you can ask. Yes. Uh, thank you. Thank you for eping. And uh, those who have questions can just unmute yourself to ask or put your question in the chat box. And thank you to 
the other two speakers as well for speaking at this yeah. event and thank you to everybody who already contributed with questions and with discussion on this quickly developing topic. And if there's no more question, if you have any comments and thoughts, uh, you can just, uh, we can just have discussion now. <laughs>